the show over to Will. All right. Well, thanks, Anita, and thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> so here we are at the Farm, Forest, and Garden Expo, and I'm not talking about any of those things, really. Um, but as we, you all know, I'm sure you all know, that um, there are plenty of streams and rivers that uh, drain fields, forests, and gardens as well. And so what happens in farms, forests, and fields, and gardens influences what happens in the water. Um, and it, it determines water quality. And I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to talk today about how uh, streams, rivers, and lakes, wetlands that are connected um, help clean up some of that pollution. Not all of it, but some of it. And that's why we have the title that we have, which is Our Rivers, the Livers of Watersheds. And I'm going to talk about rivers. I'm going to talk a little bit about livers and then what rivers do in watersheds. So first of all, why do we care about rivers? And I'm sure you all do. That's maybe part of why you're here. First off, they're beautiful. They're just uh, really nice things to look at. This happens to be a picture of the Androscoggin River, uh, which drains Maine and New Hampshire. Um, they're also fun. Um, these are some pictures that I happen to come across. Uh, we go canoeing on there, we go fishing in there, uh, and we can go swimming in there. So these are just places where we just uh, enjoy, enjoy being. We care about rivers because they're habitat as well. Um, different size rivers from small headwater streams to, to larger rivers, life is in there. There's, obviously there's fish, but there's also birds that use it, also mammals. Here are a couple of uh, river otters. So another reason why we care about rivers. And they're also useful. So um, we use them for various reasons. Drinking water. Um, this is an example of Penichuk River, uh, which is a water supply for uh, Nashua. Uh, we put dams on rivers, which um, provide hydropower. Um, there's oftentimes fields near rivers, and we can also use the water for irrigation. And so they're also very, very useful. All the major cities in New Hampshire are on rivers. And this is actually true uh, pretty much all over the country. All our big cities, if they're not on the coast, if they're inland, chances are they're on a river. There's a few exceptions, actually. But here's just the example from uh, Littleton and an example from Manchester, in part because of the Industrial Revolution. We built mills, and we, got the, we used the usefulness aspect um, for hydropower. Uh, so that's why cities are where they are. And that's why people in New Hampshire, uh, as well as elsewhere, are really concerned about water quality. So this was a survey that was done um, by folks at uh, Plymouth State University, actually. A colleague who's now at UNA, Shannon Rogers, who's in extension uh, now. Um, they did a survey of New Hampshire residents, and they showed that um, concern about level of pollution in local streams, rivers, lakes, and bays. A lot of people in New Hampshire are very concerned. Some are somewhat concerned. Um, and almost all people are at least somewhat concerned about making sure that, um, that the pollution levels remain low. So people in New Hampshire care. And actually, um, here's, uh, and, and just to point out that the White Mountains of New Hampshire are kind of the water tower for New England in a lot of ways. So this is showing that you the state of New Hampshire, surrounded by Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts. And here are the watershed boundaries. So here's the Merrimack River, here's the Connecticut River, the Saco, uh, the Androscoggin, and then here's the seacoast. So the lamprey would be down in here somewhere. Um, and you can see that all of these watersheds kind of start, start here and drain outward. So the water that's generated within the White Mountains, which is up here, flows out and is used by the city of Portland, by all these cities along the, the Merrimack down in Massachusetts. And so they also care about the quality of the water. So why am I comparing, why am I equating rivers and livers in this case? Any guesses? Filters. Yeah, they're not, livers aren't really beautiful, right? Uh, we don't recreate in them uh, or anything like that. They're kind of ugly, actually. So it's kind of the opposite of a river. But rivers are also useful. Um, and they're really actually very important. They, they remove contaminants from our bodies and make sure that, um, that our bloodstream remains clean. And uh, so 
So rivers actually do kind of the same thing. So rivers remove contaminants too. I'm going to say some, just to make sure that you don't think that they can clean up everything. But um, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about how this happens. How, how are they able to do that? So historically, we've often said that um, the solution to pollution is dilution. I'm sure you probably heard this uh, at some point or another. Um, they carry things away, right? So another thing, when we put our cities on rivers, there's a wastewater treatment plant now. Historically, we didn't even have that. But that pollution would then be transported away by the river so that it doesn't contaminate the local place where the people are living or working if it's a factory. Um, and then as it flows downstream, more water gets in and it starts to dilute. The, the place right near the pollution is probably not, you know, is, is kind of polluted. But as you go further down, it can um, dilute and then become less of a problem. But we also started to realize that except when it's not. It's the solution except when it's not. And this is just an example of pollution on the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, which is one of the sparks, literally, of the Clean Water Act uh, and the EPA back in the early 70s, where it actually caught on fire um, because of local pollution. And so clearly, this pollution was not diluted. And so we needed to do things to uh, improve water quality. On fire multiple times. Right, and this one was, was the one that got the high publicity. And then, and then political action, and that's when they, uh, the, the, the uh, Congress formed the EPA. Um, I'm going to be talking more specifically about nitrogen pollution for most of today, uh, because it's the, same, it's the same kind of issue where, um, okay, yeah, we can, uh, there's a lot of nitrogen in wastewater. Um, there's a lot of nitrogen fertilizers, so this is where it kind of starts to connect to uh, some of the fields and garden stuff. Um, and then also forests are actually really good at storing nitrogen or keeping nitrogen. So we kind of want to understand uh, what happens because if you have too much nitrogen, that can all be sort of transported downstream to our coasts. And then what happens then is that a lot of our estuaries, the coastal zones, become eutrophied. Um, they, uh, or cause harmful algal blooms, which also happens in many of our lakes in New Hampshire too. So this is just an example, just, you know, an uh, uh, algal bloom just makes it green. And sometimes a lake surface can look like a lawn. You know, it's that green. Um, so we really are trying hard to understand, especially how good are rivers at helping clean up um, nitrogen before it gets to some of these uh, areas that are sensitive. So like lakes where we go swimming in um, and our coastal zones. So we've done a really good job of cleaning up uh, point sources because of the establishment of the EPA and the Clean Water Act. Um, and we continue to improve that, uh, improve uh, point source management, uh, especially in the seacoast. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We're still improving our wastewater treatment plants. But the problem is that um, there's, there's a lot of non-point sources. So this is where the landscape as a whole contributes nitrogen too excess nitrogen that is um, above and beyond what plants can use. And so here's just an example for the Great Bay. Sorry, it doesn't say it's, it's the Great Bay Estuary. This is from the uh, Piscataqua Region Estuarine Partnership. They do a study of uh, and publish every three years or so uh, an update of the state of the estuary. And they kind of keep track of this. And so wastewater treatment plants introduce about a third of the nitrogen, but then two thirds of the nitrogen is coming from the watersheds. Um, it's a very different kind of nitrogen. It's diffuse, but it's, it ends up in the estuary nevertheless. So this is kind of the part where um, I'm going to focus on what, how rivers help clean that up. There's also actually in the news right now, if you get the Seacoast papers, uh, maybe even uh, throughout New Hampshire as well, but um, Great Bay, EPA has been keeping uh, tabs on what's going on in Great Bay. They issue permits to individual communities to manage nitrogen. They is issue permits for the wastewater. And they also issue separate permits for um, stormwater. But what they are talking about doing now is um, to better manage for nitrogen, give all the towns that drain to Great Bay one permit and work together. So solve the problem together. 
this is all a draft right now, and, and actually there's going to be some uh, meetings next week, I think, in Dover and other communities to talk about what this means for the communities. But this has the potential also to um, uh, optimize how you use your resources. So we have limited resources. Maybe the best place to manage nitrogen is not your local town. Maybe if you uh, contribute a little bit less, you can do more in another community, and then that would be OK. So that's, that's part of what, what's going on. And rivers actually, I argue, can be part of this solution because we can think about how they contribute to uh, removal of, of nutrients as well. So do rivers help clean up non-point pollutants? Yes, at times, unless they're overwhelmed. And that's kind of the, one of the take home messages here um, that they do, but they can be overwhelmed. And I'm gonna talk about how that works. So how do they do that? Actually, I'm going to get a little bit technical uh, to help explain how this happens. Um, but basically, biological activity is what helps uh, take out nitrogen. The permanent removal of nitrogen is, is through this process called denitrification. So basically, if you have nutrients coming into a stream, so if you can imagine that this is the stream reach, it's just a conceptual model, you have inputs of Nitrate and ammonium, these are two major forms that are in fertilizer as well, but they leach out, especially nitrate. They are taken up by the plants or algae or bacteria. Um, and then under the, on the right, under the right circumstances, when oxygen starts to go away, nitrate is converted to N2 gas, which just goes into the atmosphere. And most of our atmosphere is actually this gas. So 70% of what we breathe in every, every, every time we breathe is, is this gas. So it's harmless. It does nothing. So this process permanently takes it out. And so that's a good thing. And that's the process that I'm going to kind of focus on here. Because then if this is taken out like this, then less is getting downstream. And that's all because of biological activity. So uh, this is a little bit of a confusing, maybe a little bit of confusing gra uh, graph, but then when we think about how much can be taken out, it's basically about supply and demand. So um, what, I, what I have here, if you can look at this top graph, so on this graph, on this axis here, we have increases in uh, flow. So this is a storm event, this is a dry base flow event, right? Just kind of uh, a dry period. During um, low flows, the inputs of these, uh, nitrog this nitrogen to uh, surface waters is roughly balanced by the demand for that. So there's enough biological activity to take it all out. Then if you have storms coming or flows increase, you know that the supply of that nutrient also increases because you're flushing material from the landscape. And so that goes up. And maybe at first, the demand also increases, can, can increase with that. But then at some point, this is kind of a hypothesis, at some point, the supply increases and, and the, the amount of biological activity that can happen in the, in, in the streams, uh, the, the connected set of streams, plateaus. It, it just can't keep up. There's not enough going on in the streams to be able to take all that. So when you start off uh, um, at low flows, supply and demand are balanced, and you have relatively little getting down to, uh, to these estuaries or lakes. And then at some point, the supply outweighs the demand. And, um, and that's when you have a lot of material getting down to the coastal zone. And then it causes issues. And so that's uh, the proportion of nitrogen that's removed by the river network is shown here. It's really high under these low flows and starts to go down. And then at these really high flows, it can influence almost nothing. So when we think about then this balance between supply and demand, what influences that? So first I'll focus on the factors influencing demand. And basically these are the, 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 the factors, I think, that sort of dominate this, this ability of river systems to help clean up pollution, this nitrogen pollution. Obviously I said biological activity, but that biological activity requires habitat. So how much habitat is there available for this biological activity to occur in? What is the temperature? Because we also know that uh, the warmer the temperature, the, uh, the, better able, the more active the life is in the rivers. Like in, in, in winters, you don't see much happening in streams and rivers. And in summers, that's where you see a lot of stuff going on. And so temperature also influences this. 
And then also, where are the inputs occurring on the landscape? Because that influences how much habitat there, that material will be exposed to for potential biological activity. So if all your sources, all your pollutants are way upstream, they'll flow through the entire river network. And so be, there's a lot of potential for removal. And then, or if you have uh, all your sources near the mouth, then it just gets right in the river and out without being exposed to that biological activity. So that all influences the demand. And then the supply is then a combination of how much flow do you have and what's in that flow. So both of those things combine to determine what the supply of the nitrogen is. And the, it's the balance of these two things then that, um, that, that determine what is removed, how much rivers are able to remove from the river, uh, from downstream flu uh, fluxes. So I have a map here just to, to sort of demonstrate what I'm talking about because I don't mean just like one river or one stream because every stream flows down into a larger stream. That stream flows down into a river. Sometimes uh, you, it enters into a pond or a lake or a reservoir. And all those things kind of work together to help clean things up. This is a map of the, uh, the Merrimack River watershed here and the seacoast watersheds here with, uh, with the uh, location of land use as well as agriculture, which is a little bit hard to see, but it's the, it's the uh, green. And then the white is just forest. Here's Winnipesaukee and Squam Lake and a few of the other bigger lakes. Um, and basically, and, and you can see the river system in here. So these little uh, sticks, these lines are, are the streams and rivers. And it's not even showing all the small headwater streams, but basically, Streams are throughout the landscape. They're, they're everywhere. And so once that material gets in, then it's uh, part of the network. It's part of this liver that uh, helps clean up nutrients. So the amount of habitat here is a function of all of this together. And the location of inputs is determined by where people do stuff. So here, you know, you can kind of imagine if, if you see where these developed areas are. We have impervious surfaces and lawns and things like that. There may be a source, and, and here it's kind of further downstream, right? A lot of times that is, but some of these sources are further up, and so are going to be more, um, have more habitat, basically, then for uh, bi that biological activity to occur. So that's a demonstration. You know, so going back to this, looking at these different factors, we have to think about um, where, where people are doing things, where the sources of pollution are, relative to where the habitat is. So, and I already mentioned this, but the other one, the supply, um, is much greater than demand during high flows. I, I already talked about this, but just for completeness, flow conditions are, are very important here. <coughs> oh, what is going on there? Oh, yeah. So, one of the things, uh, sorry, just forgot what I had here. <laughs> um, so, we can actually measure some of these things as well. So, uh, one of the things that we do at UNH is that we're using uh, fairly high-tech instruments to help us understand how does flow condition influence the ability of rivers to uh, clean up some of this nitrogen pollution. So, what we do is, this is just a conceptual river network here. So, this is the watershed. And these are the streams that drain. So, this is like your small headwater stream that you were mentioning. And that flows down, connects with another one, another small one to make a larger stream. And then it happens again. And then you get down to a larger river. So what we've done is we, we deployed these um, instruments in these small headwater streams to get at what is coming into the river, in, into the river network, the whole, in the whole watershed. And then we also measure down at the mouth of the river to compare this is what's getting in and this is what's coming out. So we look at this uh, uh, across different storm sizes. So basically, as storms increase, we have a certain amount of nitrate that gets in to the stream. And we can see how that differs in different kinds of, of land use types. So here's a forest. It increases slower. Anthro stands for anthropogenic, meaning people-influenced watersheds. It could be uh, um, an urban area, suburban area, uh, a field, anything like that. So we can track that. And then we just compare it then to what we measure at the mouth, and we can then uh, determine what proportion is removed. We did this study in the uh, Oyster River 
watershed, so near campus. The campus is right around, is right here. Um, but we found a bunch of different um, locations where we could deploy these sensors. And this is what those sensors look like. They are um, really nifty, high tech. I don't understand how they work uh, particularly well. But um, they, you can put them in the water and leave them there. And then they measure constantly across storm events. You know? So they let us look at how uh, concentrations vary um, in different storm sizes. His, before we had these instruments, we couldn't really do this very well because you'd always have to go out and collect a water bottle and bring it back. So you, it, it's very difficult to collect many measurements, so you couldn't capture what's happening through an entire storm. But now we have these instruments and they help us a lot for understanding these things. So we were able to then test the idea that, and, and this is just a summary of, of all the measurements, where we, uh, we did manage to, um, in the Oyster River, determine what proportion of the nitrogen coming in to the river network is retained as a function of storm size. And so basically what this says is that 70% on average of the nitrogen coming in during low flows is retained by the river system. We think it's denitrified. But then um, as that storm size increases, that goes down. <clears throat> and actually we kind of think uh, p potentially, although there's a lot of uncertainty once we get to the bigger storms, <clears throat> that uh, the, the, the river network might actually be a source of nitrogen uh, at really high flows. <coughs> but in, in general, though, it, it's sort of consistent with that, um, that graphic of the comparison of supply and demand, that as your storm size increases, the supply of nitrogen increases faster than the demand for that nitrogen. So what, what you can then do is um, sort of when does, wh which parts of the watershed are more delivering more nitrogen to the coast. And so this is actually for the, uh, for the Ipswich River watershed in northeastern Massachusetts. So we, that's another place where we do a lot of work. Um, Ipswich is right here. Uh, if you're familiar with the Boston area, Bur this is Burlington uh, Mass and Redding is right here. So 95 goes like this. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, the, the darker the color, the greater the proportion of nitrogen that gets to the uh, Plum Island Sound. So under low flow, it's only those places that are right near, like Ipswich, and maybe a little bit up. And you can see that some of the headwater streams, they can remove more. But then under high flow conditions, a much greater part of the watershed is contributing to um, the estuary. So this is a, a useful map because um, it tells you where should you prioritize your, uh, your reduction of, ni of excess nitrogen. or where might you uh, restore wetlands or riparian zones? Or where might you uh, put in storm detention ponds you know, for, uh, for road runoff and things like that? So that's the kind of thing that, that we can do. And it sort of it tells you how able were these rivers at cleaning up some of the nitrogen. Um, so just pollution levels, obviously, they influence supply uh, of material, but they also then also influence demand. So this is kind of a, a data slide. Uh, I do have a few data slides to show that wh what this is basically saying is that as nitrate concentrations increase, the biological activity does not keep up and actually goes down. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty and scatter here, but this is from rivers all over the country, um, including forest, agricultural streams, and urban streams. So you can see that they all kind of follow that relationship. And this has been shown in other studies as well. So as pollution levels increase, that also uh, reduces the biological activity. Okay. Um, here, in contrast, it shows you, uh, a, this is from a, a different study, um, not from New Hampshire, but it's also representative of what we uh, think is going on, that as temperature increases, that denitrification rate that pulls out nitrogen increases. So again, the warmer the temperature, the more is able to uh, be denitrified. And, um, and this is also useful because you know, we have uh, cold winters and uh, late spring is still cold. And that is when these denitrification rates are relatively low, which means that the nitrogen that gets into rivers in the late spring is probably getting down to the estuary and to the Gulf of Maine and maybe influencing the algal blooms that are occurring there. So things like that. 
So temperature, temperature is a factor. Um, and then again, the amount of habitat um, makes a difference. So what this is showing, so this is a river network here, just showing you the river network again. But in fact, river networks are comprised of a lot of other features just other than rivers and streams. There are like ponds, like beaver ponds, or just other natural ponds. There could be uh, lakes. There are reservoirs where people have constructed dams and made more habitat that way. Um, and uh, under high flows, the floodplain also becomes connected. So once the river gets high enough, it, it floods over into the nearby riparian zone. And then all of that then it becomes habitat as part of that. And so this is kind of showing uh, a similar graph to what I showed before. Low flow, uh, a lot of nitrogen can be removed. That goes down. This is for uh, stream channels only. This is from a model. This is not real data. This is from a model. But then if we add the ponds and we add the lakes um, and we add the floodplains, we can really we can increase all that. So again, this is relevant because sometimes we manage our rivers to, to isolate the river from the nearby floodplain. But if we sort of allow that to be connected, then it can be, um, become part of the, the solution here. So this is part of the amount of habitat. Um, the other issue here is that uh, reservoir, so reservoirs increase habitat, right? Um, and we have a lot of them around. Here's an example of the mill pond in, um, in Durham. And this is the way the stream looks upstream of the reservoir. You know, so you can see there's, a, there's differences. This is flowing, kind of narrow. This is still and kind of wide. Um, that's an example of how reservoirs change things. And we also know that um, these reservoirs are able to remove quite a bit of nitrogen. Individual reservoirs now, not just, uh, so if you have a reservoir, you can remove on average about 30% of the nitrogen in that reservoir. That's kind of based on a study that's uh, not too, too long ago. So the reservoirs are able to do that. Um, here's actually an example of the, the Mill Pond Reservoir uh, from drone imagery. So this is uh, courtesy of Mike Ruthier, who is at uh, UNH in the GIS. And he uh, associated with Granite, the GIS lab. Here's the dam. Here's Route 108. And isn't that an interesting picture? I don't know. It's just kind of fun to look at. So the main river kind of comes in here and flows like this. But you have all of this flooded habitat around the sides here. This is a little bit higher, kind of forming a little island or peninsula. This is a, a, a wetland. But it makes it much patchier and more complicated and still water where oxygen can be used up. Life is able to form. There's a lot of algal blooms and things like that. So we're actually spending a fair amount of time trying to understand how effective is this a particular reservoir at removing nitrogen because the town of Durham is thinking about pulling this out because it's, it's an impaired dam. It's a, it's a dam that's degrading, it's old, and it would be very expensive to rebuild it. Um, so the, the question is, should we just pull them out and let the, the river return, right, back to its natural flow? Um, this is not, and, and, if it, and if you did take this out, then you would potentially have more nitrogen coming to the estuary, which is already nitrogen impaired. So that's why we're spending some time trying to understand that. Um, and this is not just a local issue. I, I'm sure you're all familiar with dams near your, where you live. These, this is a distribution of the dams <laughs> in New England, right? I mean, obviously, we're not covered completely in dams, but just at that scale with, with the size of those dots, it looks like they're everywhere. And they actually are everywhere. Um, and here are where all the dams have been removed. So still a relatively small proportion of the total, but it's increasing because a lot of them are getting old. Um, and the, this is what it looks like for uh, Great Bay. So here's the, here's the lamprey, right? Or here's the lamprey right here. Um, and so you can see the distribution of dams just within the seacoast uh, watersheds that drain to, to Great Bay. So potentially there's a, a fair amount of habitat in, in these artificial reservoirs that may be taken away in the future because of dam removals. So the amount of habitat is, uh, is a big factor. Um, and uh, what we do know also, and this makes sense, is that the bigger watersheds remove more nitrogen. 
The interesting thing here, I, this is kind of a, a little cartoon here, and you're wondering why am I putting these animals on, on, the, on the screen. But there's an interesting uh, theory in ecology called the metabolic theory of ecology, which basically says as the, as the body size increases from um, a small mouse to an elephant, the metabolism of that organism increases in a predictable way. And you can see that we, we're including plants, mammals, birds, bats, fish, insects. And when you look at the metabolism, you know, basically, you know, when you breathe in and out, we're metabolizing right now. We're using energy to stay alive. That's basically what it is. And that the uh, energy used by that organism increases along this line. And it increases a little bit slower than, um, than the organism size, meaning that a metabolism of a mouse is faster than the metabolism of an elephant, but it all fits on that line. And we've been doing some work basically kind of trying to think of watersheds in the same way where you, know, you have a, a stream network that's in a small watershed versus a stream network in a large watershed. How does that, um, how does that uh, differ? And what we find actually, and it's, it's actually not that clear in this slide, but that the um, metabolism of a watershed increases faster than the, than the watershed size. Meaning that as you in start to put larger rivers into the system, you get um, a greater ability to process pollutants, which is related to this idea of uh, the amount of habitat. So that's kind of uh, another, another factor. Um, and then also location of input. So where do people develop? Where do people live? Where do people farm? Compared to the water body that we care about. So here we're comparing two watersheds, again, the Ipswich and the Lamprey. And the, the red color, the hot spots there, are where uh, the nitrogen sources are in the watershed. So here's, I guess, this would be uh, Newmarket, like right, right down here somewhere, right? Um, and you can see that, the, and this is the main stem of the lamprey, and you can see a lot of the development is sort of along that main stem, kind of not that far away from the mouth, whereas here's the Ipswich, and you can see that most of the development is sort of up in the headwaters. So the development is skewed further away in the Ipswich than it is in the lamprey, and that's what this skewness index kind of means. It means that sort of uh, further away if it's greater than one, and closer to the mouth when it's less than one. And that actually determines, also influences, the ability of the river network to remove nitrogen. So that's relevant to the location of inputs. So what are some of the implications for managing nitrogen fluxes? We can go back to um, the factors influencing uh, demand here. And again, it's that same set of bubbles where, for example, biological activity, we need to protect surface waters. Um, for habitat, reconnect floodplains. How much ponded water do we have? Um, for location of inputs, where do we uh, uh, recommend future land use to occur? Or where do we recommend mitigation to occur? Those are all factors that can be managed in the landscape. Um, and then the factors influencing supply is kind of the same same idea is that for flow, we can do stormwater management or you know, managing how impervious surfaces are connected and things like that. And as well as you know, the actual pollution itself. So how much excess fertilizer do we have on the landscape? Can we optimize how much fertilizer to add to, to fields so that there's not that much extra? And this is actually a lot of work that's going on at the Ag Experiment Station to try to help to optimize some of that stuff. So that's, that's what we can manage. Um, oh yeah, and then, and then the other idea is that because watershed